Sweet Land of Liberty, the 18th Century, brings you the most memorable moments in America's history. In this program, you'll learn about the city of Cahokia, the lost colony of Roanoke, the Salem Witch Trials, the Boston Tea Party, the Bill of Rights, and the nation's nine capitals. Many stories are told about large empires and civilizations of the past, as complex and crowded as any society could have been hundreds of years ago. While those stories usually focus on cultures like the Mayans of Mexico and Central America and the Incas of South America, the center of America itself was the site of an amazing culture that thrived for hundreds of years. These Native Americans, numbering in the tens of thousands, were concentrated in a single city called Cahokia. Set along the Mississippi River, Cahokia was located very near where the modern-day city of St. Louis is found. But the real name of the city, and its people, are unknown. The name Cahokia is a tribe of Alinawek Indians who moved into the area in the 1600s, long after the original inhabitants disappeared. Those people lived there from 700 to 1400, with the peak of development and growth between 1050 and 1200, a sudden population explosion known as a Big Bang. At that time, it's estimated that as many as 20,000 people lived there, making Cahokia larger than London was at the time. The city covered more than six square miles, with homes built in rows, large open plazas, and huge farmlands surrounding the area. Corn had become a very important crop for the people of Cahokia, which may have contributed to the rapid growth in population. Archaeologists who have studied the area don't know all the facts about Cahokia, but they do believe the city was run by a single, powerful figure, like a chieftain or king. The population was thought to be complex, being structured into several classes, from wealthy to poor. Perhaps the most unique feature of Cahokia were the more than 120 mounds that were built there. Many of them were flat platform types, with houses and other buildings built on them. Other mounds were cone-shaped and used as burial sites. The largest of these mounds is known as Monk's Mound, the largest man-made earthen mound on the North American continent. At nearly 100 feet high, 950 feet long, and 830 feet wide, Monk's Mound is so large, it's actually bigger than the Great Pyramid of Egypt. When Cahokia was at its busiest time around 1100, Monk's Mound had four different levels or terraces. It's believed that a large palace or temple once stood on the highest level, possibly the home of Cahokia's leader, with trees and other buildings on the lower terraces. Another feature of Cahokia is what is called Woodhenge, named after Stonehenge found in England. As many as five wood henges were built over a period of 200 years, between 900 and 1100. These circular-shaped pits had anywhere between 12 and 60 large wooden posts, very carefully and accurately positioned. Studies indicate that a wood henge was used as a calendar, with sunlight creating shadows with the posts. As the position of the sun in the sky changed with the seasons, the positions of the shadows also changed. With farming being all-important to the people of Cahokia, Woodhenge helped them to plan the planting and harvesting of their crops. A large stockade fence, two miles long, was built around the central part of Cahokia around 1100, then rebuilt three times up to 1300. Each fence used somewhere between 15 and 20,000 logs made from oak and hickory trees. Each log was a foot across, and 20 feet high. The purpose of the fences isn't clear, since there's no sign of any invasions or attacks on Cahokia. Some archaeologists believe the fence may have been used to separate people of different social classes, keeping the haves isolated from the have-nots. Still, it's thought the fence was probably for protection. From what, it's not known. The biggest mystery of Cahokia is... 
what happened to it. By the year 1400, the city was completely abandoned. No one can tell where the population went or why. Suggestions have included a drastic change in climate, which would have severely affected the crops and animals in the area, along with the possibility of disease or a change in government. What remains today are many of the mounds and a rebuilt version of a woodhenge, all part of a state of Illinois historical site and museum. Yearly attendance nears 300,000 visitors, curious as to what might have happened to one of America's first and largest cities. Nearly 100 years after Christopher Columbus first sailed with three ships to discover the New World, an area we know today as the Caribbean, a Briton named Sir Walter Raleigh sent explorers to find more lands. Under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I of England, Raleigh was encouraged to explore the New World with the hope of building a settlement there. In 1584, explorers found Roanoke Island, part of the state of North Carolina today, and returned to England with two native chiefs, Manteo and Wanches. Both returned to Roanoke with a second expedition in 1585, but the English settlers quickly returned home after scuffling with the local natives. Only 15 sailors stayed behind to maintain the settlement. A third expedition in 1587, with whole families joining the explorers, intending to settle in the New World, totaled nearly 120 individuals. They were led by John White, named governor of the Roanoke Colony, and a very good artist who made many sketches and paintings of the area and its people. One month later, Virginia Dare was born on Roanoke, making her the first English child to be born on soil that would eventually be known as America. White then sailed back to England for supplies. But war between Spain and England prevented him from returning to the area until 1590. When he did, he was stunned at what he found. Nothing. The settlement was completely abandoned. There was no sign of the almost 120 folks he had left there three years before. Relations with local native Indians had been touchy since the first landing. In fact, the 15 Brits from the second journey had been killed by the locals before the third group arrived. White did find a large fence of trees, seemingly built to prevent an attack. On one tree was carved the word Croatone, another just Crow. Croatone was an island just south of Roanoke, known today as Hatteras Island. But White encountered bad weather and couldn't check the island, returning to England with no answer at all as to what had happened. Today, archaeologists have used modern digital technology to continue the search for answers, but they have only found traces of fort walls and some structures buried in the ground. Not much of an answer to what did happen to the lost colony of Roanoke. Colonization in the New World of America continued into the 1600s. A group of English businessmen received the go-ahead to establish a settlement called the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630. It was an area known today as the state of Massachusetts, including towns like Boston and Salem. Many of the new settlers in Salem were strong believers in the Church of England. They were called Puritans. Their ways of life were hard-working, very strict, and God-fearing. In 1689, a Boston minister named Cotton Mather wrote a very popular book about witches and witchcraft. According to legend, witches, both women and men, are associated with the devil, capable of casting spells and other evil things. Mather's book was read in Salem, and, perhaps by coincidence, when a little girl became ill in 1692, the doctor's diagnosis was witchcraft. The nine-year-old girl, named Betty Paris, had enjoyed fantastic stories told by a local slave from Barbados, named Tituba. When Betty and two other girls began having convulsive fits, Tituba and two other women were blamed as causing them because they were witches. 
Tituba didn't help the matter when she admitted that she was a servant of the devil, saying that other witches were in the area. The search quickly led to hundreds of accusations, as the Puritans were in a panic to rid their land of evil. Even though there was no real evidence of witchery, many of the accused were single out because they were non-Puritans, poor or homeless. Special trials began in June of 1692. Much of the testimony was based on what is called spectral evidence, proof based on evil visions and dreams, hardly scientific. Some of the defendants were found guilty, and despite the myth that these supposed witches were burned at the stake, those found guilty were actually hanged. When the trials ended in May of 1693, 19 people, 14 women and 5 men, had been hanged for witchcraft. Another man died, crushed by heavy rocks, as officials tried to obtain a confession from him. Four more died in jail. Today, it's thought that those who seemed to be under witchcraft spells were possibly having a psychological reaction known as hysteria, or a medical reaction to tainted food. On several occasions since then, the state of Massachusetts has publicly apologized to the descendants of those accused and tried for witchcraft. Even so, the local high school in Salem calls its athletics teams the witches. American playwright Arthur Miller drew upon the Salem witch trials in his 1953 play, The Crucible. The story was inspired by the witch hunt activities of the U.S. government at the time, making quick and often false accusations of Americans being communists. It was very much like the accusations of witchcraft in Salem, nearly 300 years before. As American colonists struggled to find some way to break free from the military and economic grip of Great Britain in the 1770s, groups of settlers staged protests to make their feelings known. One such group was the Sons of Liberty. The Sons of Liberty were founded by Samuel Adams and included members like his second cousin, John Adams, who would become the second president of the United States 25 years later. Other Sons of Liberty were John Hancock, Patrick Henry, and Paul Revere. By the 1770s, Americans were brewing more than a million pounds of tea, imported from Britain, a year. With that much tea being consumed, the British figured to make even more money by placing a tax on it. But the colonists had long yelled, No taxation without representation. Just what did that mean? Basically, it didn't seem fair that folks in America were being taxed by England, where they had no legislators in Parliament. They felt they shouldn't have to pay taxes when their interests weren't being represented by the British government. One of these taxes was created in 1767 with the Townsend Revenue Act. It taxed not just tea, but other items like glass, lead, oil, paint, and paper. These were materials the colonists used to build structures, light their homes, and print books and newspapers. While much of the Townsend Revenue Act was repealed in 1770, the Tea Act of 1773 continued to make tea drinking an expensive pastime. The Sons of Liberty agreed that something had to be done about the high cost of tea, so they gathered over 5,000 people for a meeting in Boston on December 16, 1773. By evening, it was decided that about 100 protesters, many disguised as American Indians, would board three ships in Boston Harbor. These ships held tea from the British East India Company. Once aboard the ships, the protesters dumped nearly 100,000 pounds of tea, worth almost $2 million by today's standard, into the harbor's water. The Sons of Liberty were careful not to damage or destroy anything else on the ships during their three-hour spree. As a result, the Brits were angered, as one might expect, and they shut down Boston Harbor. It would not be reopened until the lost tea was paid for, something the settlers refused to do. By mid-1774, Britain had enacted a number of new acts, 
further restricting and punishing the people of Massachusetts. By September, the First Continental Congress met in Philadelphia, petitioning King George III of England to remove the acts. His refusal, among other factors, would lead to the battle at Lexington and Concord in April of 1775, marking the opening shots of the American Revolution. When the first Federal Congress of the United States convened in September of 1789, they agreed to propose ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution for the 13 states of America to ratify. These ten very important additions to the original document that defined the United States government became known as the Bill of Rights. The purpose of these first ten amendments was to guarantee certain rights and freedoms for all American citizens that were overlooked when the original document was written in 1787. The First Amendment guarantees to individuals the freedom to practice a religion of their choice, the freedom of speech, freedom of the press and the media, the right to gather peacefully in a public place, and the right to petition the government are also protected by the First Amendment. But simply, your beliefs and religion are your business and can't be interfered with. But the freedom to say whatever you like shouldn't be abused. There's an old saying, just because you have the freedom of speech doesn't mean you can yell fire in a crowded movie theater. The press, including newspapers, TV, radio, magazines, and such, can say what they like, as long as there are no lies or words that can hurt others. Just to clarify, anything written that is harmful is libel. Anything said verbally that is harmful is slander. The right to gather or assemble allows individuals to meet so they can discuss, promote, or argue their individual ideas. Once again, if the meeting involves a crime or hurts someone, that is not part of the right. The Second Amendment. People have the right to keep and bear weapons in order to form a militia for a free state. There is much discussion in the country about the right for individuals to keep guns, whether it be for sport or personal protection. When the amendment was written more than 200 years ago, there were no police departments. The militia that's mentioned refers to a group of citizens banded together in the place of an organized law enforcement agency. Plus, the new government had just completed a war with Great Britain and needed to protect itself from any foreign invasions, as well as any wild animals that might be around the many undeveloped parts of our new country. A lot has changed since then. Still, the right of the individual to keep a gun is something that cannot and should not just be taken away without a complete study and consideration of that right. And the right to keep guns is not allowed for people convicted of serious crimes or those with mental illness. The Third Amendment. The quartering of soldiers is prohibited in private homes, without the homeowner's consent, during peacetime. This amendment was very appropriate during the late 1700s, but really doesn't apply in today's America. This amendment protects the rights of the everyday citizen over that of the military. And when was the last time anyone had to unfairly house a military person in their house? The Fourth Amendment. A person's house, car, or self cannot be searched without probable cause or proper search warrant. This amendment protects people from searches and or seizing of personal property by the government, including police and other law enforcement members. If police have probable cause, that is, a strong reason to believe someone has done or is doing something illegal, then they can ask a judge to issue a search warrant. With that, they have obtained the right to inspect and search an individual and his or her property. Another exception is stop and frisk, where, with reasonable suspicion that a crime has, is, or is going to be committed, police can stop and quickly search a person's clothing. The Fifth Amendment. 
A person cannot be accused of a crime without indictment by a grand jury, nor can they be put on trial twice for the same crime, nor testify against themselves in a trial, nor put in jail without due process, nor have their private property taken by the government unless they pay for it. A grand jury is a group of people who review evidence and decide whether a person should be charged with a crime, which is an indictment. But that doesn't mean they have found the person guilty of a crime. That's what the trial is for. But they have found enough reason to have a trial. Once a person has been tried and found guilty or innocent of a crime, they cannot be tried again for that crime. That's called double jeopardy. Pleading the fifth is a phrase that's heard a lot on TV and in the movies. It means a person on trial for a crime cannot be forced to testify against him or herself, which could lead to them being found guilty, which is called self-incrimination. On the advice of my counsel, I respectfully exercise my Fifth Amendment right and decline to answer the question. Due process may sound complicated, but it basically means that someone accused of a crime is entitled to legal procedures that are fair and equal. Finally, the government cannot take a person's property, whether it's land, their house, or personal belongings, just because the government feels like it. But in some cases, like building roads, highways, airports, and other public structures, the government can use what's known as eminent domain. This means a person is paid fair market value for their land and or house, when the government thinks building on that land will best serve the general population. The Sixth Amendment. A person accused of a crime has a right to a speedy and public trial with the advice of a lawyer, an impartial jury, and to know who the accusers are and what they are accusing the person of. This amendment protects someone from being thrown into jail and forgotten. The case should be addressed quickly with proper representation and legal counsel, heard by a jury without any personal involvement, and no secrets as to what the accused has done or who was doing the accusing. The Seventh Amendment. In the case of common lawsuits, any federal claim over $20 must be tried by a jury and not by a single judge. A civil case is a disagreement between two individuals, like a lawsuit, rather than a criminal case in which a law has been broken. Anyone who brings a civil case against another party that involves damages of more than $20 in value has a right to a decision by jury, instead of a verdict by a judge. The Eighth Amendment. No one should be forced to pay excessive bail, excessive fines, or be subjected to cruel and unusual punishments. Bail is money that an accused person pays to the court so they don't have to stay in jail until their trial. If they fail to show up for their trial, that money is given up and that person is now in bigger trouble. If the accused is found guilty, then the fine should not be bigger than the crime. A simple speeding ticket should not result in thousands of dollars in fines. Some people believe the death penalty is cruel and unusual punishment and shouldn't be allowed. Other people believe that very serious crimes, such as murder, should make a person eligible for the death penalty and isn't cruel or unusual, considering their crime. The Ninth Amendment. Certain rights protected in the Constitution do not deny people their other rights. Quite simply, the Bill of Rights aren't the only rights Americans enjoy. In other words, it's not a complete list of protections provided by the Constitution. The Tenth Amendment, powers not assigned to the country by the Constitution, are reserved for the states or the people. In trying to balance the power between the federal and individual state governments, anything that's not allowed in the Constitution can be decided by the states or individuals in those states. Since the Bill of Rights was written, 17 more amendments have been added to the Constitution, covering everything from creating a federal income tax to limiting the number of four-year service terms for U.S. presidents to just two. In every case, 
Amendments to the U.S. Constitution have been made with the interests of the general public in mind, seeking to maintain a country of freedom and fairness for everyone. Now, some of the amendments in the Bill of Rights may seem outdated and not needed in the 21st century, but their inclusion in the late 1700s was very important to forging the free and democratic society that we have today. To quickly review and summarize, The first ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution are known as the Bill of Rights. 1. Freedom of Speech 2. Freedom to Own Guns 3. No Quartering of Soldiers During Peacetime 4. No Searches Without Probable Cause or a Warrant 5. A Person Accused of a Crime Cannot Testify Against Him or Herself 6. A person accused of a crime has a right to a speedy and public trial. 7. A lawsuit claim of over $20 can be heard by a jury. 8. No cruel or unusual punishments. 9. Americans have other rights than just those outlined. 10. The states and the people have rights not covered by the Constitution. Here's a question for you. What's our nation's capital? It shouldn't take you very long to answer Washington, D.C. There, in today's Capitol building, people representing every state in the Union meet to make laws, a group called Congress. There are two branches of Congress, the House of Representatives, which currently has 435 members, and the Senate, which has 100 members. With those two groups, Our legislature is known as bicameral, which is Latin for two chambers. But you might be surprised to know that Washington, D.C. wasn't our first, or only, capital. Over the last 240-some years, there have actually been nine cities, including Washington, D.C., where our national government worked. While the 13 original colonies began to form in the early 1600s, it wasn't until the 1770s when they decided to join together under a single government. With it, the colonies would take their first steps in becoming a country of separate states and gain their independence from Great Britain. In September of 1774, representatives from each colony were chosen, making up a group called the Continental Congress. They first met in the City Tavern, a quiet meeting place in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Since all the colonies weren't yet in attendance on that date, those who were held a caucus, a special meeting to establish an agenda for their next get-together. Later in the month, that first Continental Congress met at Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia. Across the next six weeks, members of the Congress put together an official list of grievances they had against King George III of Great Britain. With that done, the group agreed to meet once more in May of 1775. A month before that meeting, the first shots of the American Revolution were heard in the towns of Lexington and Concord. British soldiers planned to seize gunpowder, as well as colonial leaders Samuel Adams and John Hancock. But groups of colonists known as Minutemen formed a militia, an army of citizens, and even though the colonists were greatly outnumbered, they pushed the Redcoats back into Boston. In the end, nearly 50 of the militia were killed, as well as more than 70 British soldiers. The Second Continental Congress met in May as planned, assembling at the Pennsylvania State House, known today as Independence Hall, still in Philadelphia. Among the many actions taken during the nearly 18-month period of this Congress were the selection of General George Washington as the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, plus the formation of rules for that army, the official establishment of the Navy of the United States, an agreement to issue $3 million in Continental paper money, an additional $4 million would soon be printed, and an official treasury was created, a decision to recruit Native Americans to help the colonies in their fight for independence, assembling a committee of John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, 
Robert Livingston and Roger Sherman, whose job was to write a Declaration of Independence. By July 4th of 1776, the Congress was ready to adopt the Declaration, and with it, the colonies officially separated themselves from Great Britain. In December of 1776, the Second Continental Congress was forced to quickly move to Baltimore, Maryland, in order to escape British troops. They assembled at the Henry Fight House, staying for more than two months before it was safe to return to Philadelphia and the Pennsylvania State House. The Congress stayed there until September of 1777, largely debating the contents and formation of Articles of Confederation, the first real constitution, and discussing the creation of the first American flag. Pressure from British soldiers did not let up, and Congress was again forced to move, first for one day to the courthouse in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, then to the Yorktown Courthouse in York. Staying until June of 1778, the members of Congress were able to approve the Articles of Confederation. They also received word of an important treaty of alliance with France, assembled by a committee headed by Benjamin Franklin. By then, the British proposed to negotiate a peace, but they would not withdraw their troops or recognize America's independence. Congress rejected the offer, and fighting in the Revolution continued. But British troops did pull out of Philadelphia and allowed Congress to move back to the city in July of 1778. They first worked at College Hall for three weeks, then went back to the Pennsylvania State House, where they would stay for nearly five years. Congress approved the printing of more paper money, began accepting ratification from the colonies, approving the Articles of Confederation, and many, many other activities needed to put a new country together, including taxing its citizens to pay for it. By March of 1781, the colonies completed ratification and, in the first meeting of a legislative group called the United States of Congress Assembled, USCA, the United States of America were officially named. The Treaty of Paris brought the American Revolution to a close in September of 1783, and Congress could finally focus on peacetime pursuits. In the next 16 years, Congress established the nation's capital in Princeton, New Jersey, first at the Prospect House, then at Nassau Hall, at the Maryland State House in Annapolis, Maryland, at the French Arms Tavern in Trenton, New Jersey, at Old New York City Hall, Francis Tavern, and Federal Hall in New York City, and ten years at Congress Hall in Philadelphia. After much discussion, it was decided to permanently place the capital of the United States on land from both Maryland and Virginia. Known as Washington, entirely in the District of Columbia, the city would be home to all three branches of the federal government, executive including the president and his cabinet, legislative with both houses of Congress, and judicial with the Supreme and other federal courts. Congress first met in the U.S. Capitol building on November 17, 1800. Much of the structure was destroyed by British soldiers who set fire to it during the War of 1812. It was repaired and expanded in the following years, with wings for the House and Senate added in the 1850s. The Grand Capitol Dome was built in 1862, replacing a smaller dome. A cast-iron statue called Freedom was placed atop the dome in 1863, where it stands today. Additional upgrades and repairs have been done over the years to the Capitol building, with the latest project being the restoration of the Capitol Dome, begun in 2013. The two-year task included repairs to the cast iron, as well as repainting and detailing one of the most well-known structures in the United States. <laughs> 